So welcome to, oh wow, it's week 14 already, isn't it? Yeah, uh, this is going to be a live recording from uh, the 4670 class week 14. And uh, we're going to be talking about security administration, which is all about basically mobile security in this in this chapter. And security administration also covers a lot of the technical controls, if you will, of devices, especially devices that are not in the direct control of an IT office, such as laptops, tablets, phones, uh, things of that nature. So it's really important how we define the practices of issuing these devices, updating these devices, and getting them back. And that covers everything from asset tagging to remote control um, rem and remote administration in particular. All right, so the book and the Security Plus exam uh, cover this topic by giving scenarios and definition style questions on the exam uh, to the tune that they'll give you a situation and then they'll ask you how it should be handled. Uh, these types of scenario questions are pretty common sense based. So if you don't try to overthink the question, you'll get it right. Uh, typically, there's two answers. There might be a little bit of minutia in there as to the correct answer, and there'll be two other qu answers on the question that you can completely dismiss because they just sound um, idiotic or erroneous uh, in and of itself. Uh, they also ask or, or give you scenarios about uh, common account management practices. Um, such as not just uh, account management, they'll also talk about onboarding, offboarding, which we'll get into here in a little bit, but they'll also could throw questions, uh, ethical questions about, well, whose device is it anyway, all right? So bring your own device policies come into play there. So is the device yours or is it the company's? Did you sign for it or did you yourself go out and buy and purchase it and you're paying the bill? So this is a common problem that you have in uh, organizations. I see it a lot in K-12 uh, and even even here in higher ed, right? This, you know, my, my phone is mine, right? Yes, I have the Blackboard app on it. Yes, I have my uh, Office 365 account on it that I can read my email. But guess what? Campus IT can't touch this. Why? Because it's mine. I'm paying for it. They're not. Right? So now, now, do they have access into my account that they can go into my email and look at it? Yes. But they can't do that on my phone. Can they go and change my Blackboard password or my Bronco Direct password? Yes, because they have direct access to it at the server, but they can't do it on my phone. Conversely, on the opposite end of the coin, if you go and you work for a company and they issue you a phone, right, an iPhone, an Android, something like that, they still, at least here in the state of California, have to make you sign um, a clause stating that they retain ownership, they retain control of that device, and they, at any time, they being the company, at any time can access it with or without your knowledge. So read the fine print. And this has been... Um, Settled in case law over the last 10, uh, 11, 12 years, uh, not only in the state of California, but, but federally and, na and nationally as well. So the onus is on um, the company to provide that information to the employee. If they don't, if, if you come work for me and I just go, oh, yeah, here's a phone. 
If I don't set any boundaries around that, you can do with that phone whatever really you want to. It's almost considered a gift, right? But if I give you the phone, I make you sign an acceptable use agreement, I outline it in the employee handbook, the acceptable use policies around that device, around your email, around your mobile, around any social media account that I give you access to, okay? Then I'm, you know, giving you the, uh, the box in which to play in, proverbially. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Yeah, I, I got on a soapbox there. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. So we look at all these different types of connections. Uh, antennas, Bluetooth, cellular, Wi-Fi, infrared, SAT, COM. Uh, and it can be, uh, like, like I said, it can be extended to social media accounts. It can be extended to email accounts. It can be extended to SMS texting as well. Um, probably one of the crazier stories that I have from uh, being a sysadmin was uh, about 10, 11 years ago. Uh, I was working at a company, I was working in a managed services department, and the owner of the company comes in and, and says, hey, I have a problem. I have an employee. I suspect that they are doing something wrong, right? And I need you to break in to their phone. And my, you know, immediately my, you know, Spidey senses kicked off and I go, well, sir, is this his phone or is it our phone? <laughs> he goes, oh, it's a company phone. I'm sorry. I was like, OK. And, you know, me being the good person that I was at the company when I was hired on, <coughs> when they um, gave me my laptop and my phone and everything else, and I'm like, where's the uh, acceptable use policy in the uh, company and the uh, employee handbook? Where's the acceptable use policy for email? Where's your password change policy? So I said, I said all these, and I'm just like a, like a new IT guy. I'm asking all these questions. And they're like, uh, well, we haven't been work. We've been trying to work on that for a while. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I'm not accepting this until I actually have that to, uh, to sign. So I, I literally, over the course of two days, wrote their acceptable use policy, their, uh, their, um, uh, mobile device policy uh, and their email policy uh, before I accepted my own equipment. <laughs> the HR the HR person thought I would like walked on water. It was great. Uh, so I was familiar with that. Um, so it was an iPhone. I believe it was uh, an, one of the earlier iPhone um, four. I think it was a, a four model. And um, I basically uh, used. Uh, a, um, I'm trying to think how I did this. Oh, I remember it wasn't even locked at the time. I, Cause I was worried like, how am I going to break into this thing? How am I going to get, and, and the phone, when it was handed to me, he didn't even have a security code on it. And, uh, lo and behold, I found a lot of illicit texts. I found out, uh, that this guy was, um, an abusive person and I dumped all of his SMS text data and uh, put it in a file uh, and then I went on to his email was completely clean his corporate email but he had his personal email on there as well so question for you because this was a company device do I have access and do I have the right to look into his personal email? Who says yes? So please note for the recording, there's about two thirds of the class that say yes. Who says no? One person says no. Two people say no. Okay. Well, the question is, it depends, right? It depends. Uh, the answer, excuse me, is depends. All right. At that point, when I took up the uh, information and I saw that 
there was probable cause of a crime being committed, all right, uh, I could have put that, I could have gone into his personal email. I elected not to, okay, because I knew enough about forensics, and I know, I don't know a whole lot about forensics, but I knew enough about it that at this point in time, I need to control this evidentiary device, and I've got to call law enforcement, okay, because I had evidence uh, of uh, an abusive relationship and an actual assault that I had read in these text messages. So I simply took and put the phone aside. I called my boss who was in with the employee and with the owner. And I said, hey, uh, can you come to my desk? I showed the phone to my, my VP. And I said, at this point in time, we got to call law enforcement. Because this, and it was relatively within the last 72, 96 hours that these texts uh, were were done, All right? Um, I don't know how in the world that they came to this conclusion that it was something that was going on. The ownership never told me. So I assumed that they had probable cause. But the last thing I remember was handing the phone over to a San Bernardino, San Bernardino County Sheriff, putting it in the evidence bag, and then walking the guy out in handcuffs. So, you know, I, I hope you never have to go through something like that in your careers. But if you do, you know what? Handle it professionally. Handle it, you know, to the best of your abilities, the best of your knowledge. All right. And always, when in doubt, ask questions and escalate. If, if it doesn't look right, if it doesn't sound right. You know, see something, say something. Sorry, went off on a tangent there. But hey, we're talking about uh, mobile uh, device management. Geofencing, the, the, the chapter covers this concept of geofencing. And with this, we have um, phones that operate within a specific area and externally. Um, so... There are ways that you can actually have an Android or an iPhone as they uh, come into an environment. They can switch from cellular, 4G, 3G, 5G, LTE, whatever, to 802.11x. All right. And your phone call can, if you're actually on a phone call, as you transition, you can actually have that transition to the 802.11x um network the carrier will allow you to do that it's some really really great technology uh, but geofencing also works from a security perspective of blocking calls you see this in government a lot who's ever heard of a skiff one person okay so you're gonna put me on the spot here i can't remember what skiff stands for but it's uh, secure confidential information, something or another. It's a place where you go into and you hold a meeting and nobody can listen in on, on that meeting. Nobody has access to that meeting from a physical and logical security perspective. And part of that is devices shouldn't work in there. It's like going walking into a Faraday cage and holding a meeting. Everybody knows what a Faraday cage is is right we've all watched mr robot i hope we've watched mr robot we know what a faraday cage is all right cool all right so from an account management perspective more along the lines of hr and we talked about this in my uh, example that i gave um management of account types is very important so one of the things that I said previously in, in, in my classes is you want to disable your root and or administrator account, administrator uh, account in Windows, especially your domain admin. Now, obviously not your domain administrator group. You want to put the individual accounts in there. And you can even subdivide groups under domain admin or you can create 
uh, multiple objects in your domain as to what permission users are going to have to what areas, what devices. And that can become very cumbersome and complex very quickly, especially when you take into consideration the size of an organization. Right? And management of that uh, can become very difficult. So how we get around that is we can typically, in large-scale companies, we go through audits in a constant uh, process. Where if you go and work for a Fortune 100 company, you're always going to be under an audit. You're either going to be preparing for an audit, in audit, or review of audit, all right, in some form or fashion, okay? Whether it's a process audit, an administrative audit, a financial audit, you know, an XYZ audit. It's uh, in very, very large publicly traded companies, uh, they have very large internal audit um, organizations and they oversee the um, internal processes and they also uh, liaison with the external auditors, typically one of the big four accounting firms. Uh, onboarding and offboarding are the concept of bringing people into an organization and getting people out of an organization. Now, bringing people into an organization is always uh, fun, and there has to be a lot of process around it. I gave an example a little bit earlier about uh, myself getting my um, phone and my laptop and everything else at this company, right, and the process that I had to go through and the, the holes, the gaps that they had in it. It wasn't a very large company. But when you go and, um, uh, for example, um, as a contractor, I went and worked for Paramount Pictures for a year. I had a year-long contract. And my first three days, uh, I actually had an entire week of onboarding. My first three days of onboarding was nothing but etiquette training. How to carry my, how, how to act, respond, and carry myself uh, on the lot, as they called it. All right? And what was acceptable behavior, what was not acceptable behavior. And they outlined it to me that any infraction of unacceptable behavior is terms for dis dismissal on the spot immediately. And it had everything to do with the folks that worked there, okay? The um, celebrities, actors, actresses, directors, writers, all right? Uh, for lack of a better term, this was their safe space, all right? And the last thing that they wanted to have was you know, starstruck employees of the lot, you know, following them around or, or acting fam, all fanboyish or fangirlish uh, about them, right? So it was very intensive, and they went over example after example of, after example of um, cases where they terminated employees, in some cases long-term employees, because they had a zero-tolerance policy. So that's kind of an extreme of an onboarding example. Typically, your onboarding examples are going to be, here's your phone, here's the acceptable use policy, here's your laptop or your tablet, here's the acceptable use policy, here's, all, here's the company handbook, read through it, sign it, give it back, right? And then whatever departmental um, onboarding practices that they have, right? And that's going to, you know, be different from somebody who's going into a sales department to somebody who's going into an IT department to somebody who's going to HR to somebody who's going into accounting, right? So offboarding or termination can come in two different flavors, all right? A, like I say, a positive experience or a not so positive experience. So let's, let's talk about the positive experience first. Somebody leaves the company. I, 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 I give my manager, uh, you know, let's back up a second. Even better, I retire, All right? I give plenty of notice to the organization of the company. Hey, this is my last date. Been with the company X number of years. Uh, I need to go through this entire process of offboarding. Now, retirement is a little bit different. All of your organizations are going to have a process for collecting assets back in the form of phones and tablets and company property, right? 
Well, when you, re when you have a retirement, that's a lot easier because you can kind of plan that out and space that out uh, over time. Um, another, and I'm going to say positive um, offboarding, is a resignation. Now, a resignation with notice, I'll put it that way. And there's two different types of resignations, all right? We'll cover the first one here. A resignation with notice. And a resignation with notice, typically in the industry, is going to be anywhere from two weeks to a full month of notice that you're leaving. Okay? Um, you know, it's an acceptable practice for someone in their 20s, early 30s, uh, entry level to mid-career, two weeks notice. I'm out the door. Thank you very much for your uh, for the opportunity. I appreciate it. All right? And over that two weeks they can go through the process of uh, turning things over, giving things back. You know, it, it's, it's still very structured, right? And it's not seen as a threatening dismissal, which is the next one, all right? A termination. And terminations come in a couple different aspects as well, all right? Termination with and without cause, okay? Termination without cause, all right, is something where you basically have like a downsizing event. You saw it very prevalently in 2008, 2009, 2010 with the recession, right? People walked in and all of a sudden, oh, wow, uh, we're downsizing by 50% today. And guess what? Sorry, you lost. And that is where you have a process in place to not only take back assets from one person, but take back assets from a lot of individuals, a lot of individuals, right? And there's case after case after case that showed that um, where um, it was difficult because HR, this kind of put a lot of pressure on HR departments uh, to have everything in place. Um, and then you have your terminations for cause. All right. Somebody did something bad, not necessarily criminal, but you know what? You're you're I'm sorry. Your services are no longer are needed. Thank you very much. I need all your stuff now. And those are the hard ones for IT departments because they need to be very tediously choreographed with HR to cut off accounts, disable accounts, um, collect uh, assets, uh, cut off communication with customers uh, and thoroughly communicate it. And the higher up the food chain the individual is, the harder it gets, all right? Because you could even have a PR. Uh, you could get your um, chief, um, oh, your information officer involved or your communications officer involved because if you have a termination of, say, uh, a CFO or a CIO or a CEO of a company, right? Um, board of directors comes down and says, hey, this is a bad person. He's or she's done something uh, uh, potentially illegal. They're dismissed. Uh, HR and IT and the organizations that uh, within the company that handle dismissals have to be very nimble in getting that done very quickly. And then you have the entire potential press fallout from that, okay? Especially when you get into Fortune 100, Fortune 50 companies. Okay, so that kind of concludes the, uh, the chapter on um, security administration. It's not really security administration from a technical perspective as much as it's security administration from uh, an administrative side, HR side perspective, because IT departments, especially IT security, have to work in lockstep with human resources. I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank you very much for your, your time. I'm going to ask the class here for, for questions in just a second.